does, and it's enough to, I don't know if he got a hand on the ball or not, but it was enough. Thank you. Thanks for attending uh, my session today. I was hoping that maybe I could uh, give you something. I was like, my program, I think, is a lot like Frank's. Frank uh, Lippy that was in here before me. And in fact, right down to the X's and O's, we're a split back rear option football team. And uh, a lot of things he was talking about, a lot of things he said, I'm thinking, I was out there listening, thinking, you know, we do this, or we've done that, or we said, he sounds a lot like us. Uh, and even to some of the, uh, the practice expectations he has and things like, things of that nature. And uh, I'm probably going to be covering some things maybe a little, a little bit differently than he would and what, what he does, but I'm sure I could give you something today that you can take back to your program and I think it'll work it and be real effective with it and, uh, in regards to motivation and goal setting in some, some of those areas. I don't t attend a lot of clinics. I don't do a lot of clinics. And it's not because I don't believe them, I do believe them, but nobody really runs our split back option here that much. I, I, I really, it's tough to get a lot of offensive information for me. Um, things may be changing down the road, I don't know, I think we're going to open our offense up maybe a little bit more, make sure I think that would be wise. Uh, Frank was talking about placing the right people in the right jobs and, and, and uh, gearing your offense to how well your kids do, and we've done a real good job of, uh, of doing that. When I had a thrower, Mac Gutierrez, a quarterback who was a thrower, we threw the ball out. Uh, ran a few more uh, wide open three and four of the receiver sets and still ran the option out of it. And uh, the last couple of years, my, my quarterback, he's had a hard time running the option. He has a hard time reading it. He has a hard time running as a runner. And, uh, and his throwing is, is good, but we're a run offense. That's part of our philosophy. Um, just from my own standpoint, I, I, I know today that we face a lot of teams that are in that uh, University of Utah spread off the quarterback and the shotgun with the, the single back. I think we faced five teams this year, six teams that run that <coughs> offense exclusively. And it is a good offense. It's tough to defend, as you guys all well know. And all you guys are running, running for a reason. But one of the things I noticed about the offense is my own personal opinion. The tighter you get in towards the, to the, uh, the red zone, the tougher it is for teams to push that ball in by throwing it. And uh, of course, when the field uh, becomes less vertical, it's tougher to throw the football. I think for high school football, that's why I like, we like running the football, is that for numerous reasons. One, I think when you run the football on a team, it demoral not demoralize them, but defeat them <coughs> mentally in a lot of ways. And the reason why is because you have to play very physical football to run it. You have to get your linemen off the, off the ball. They have to uh, move people off the ball. And uh, we coach to that. We coach to that style of offense that we're going to attack, that we're going to get after people, that we're going to push people off the ball, and we're going to uh, take it to the defense rather than a defense pinning their ears back and coming after you. I think that uh, I think that when you get inside the, the 30, the 20, you have to have a really strong run game to get the ball across the goal line. We've had team, we had teams this year that moved the football up and down on us. Uh, our defense was, I thought, fairly mediocre this year. And teams would run that ball or pass that ball up and down the field on us and uh, couldn't get the ball in the end zone. We had a great knack of keeping people out of the end zone most of the season. And I, I think in a lot of ways it was because when you spread your team out like that, it just becomes harder when you get in tighter. So we, that's one of our philosophies. I think that on all levels, we'll see what happens tomorrow in the NFL. Uh, I think usually think the team that runs the football the best are the guys that win. And uh, I think that kind of proves out statistically. When we do throw the ball, we like to throw the ball and hurt people with it. We like to go for the home run. We like to, our statistics traditionally in our, our passing game, we may throw 12 times in the game, but we'll always be usually over 100 yards and a couple scores. And uh, naturally that's because a lot of people like to put eight people in the box to stop us. And if we get a little play action going or, or if we get outside the pocket, 
we can usually get our receivers behind their safeties that they've got up at eight yards. So we've got a lot of different routes that we try to, try to make that happen. And uh, that's the bulk of our passing game. We do have a short passing game too, but we like to set up our pass with the run like most people do. Anyway, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. In the second session, I'd like to talk a little bit about our offensive line. I thought that's a, a big tradition at our school. And uh, our offensive lines have always been fairly good and pretty good. Anyway, I thought we had a really good offensive line last year. And uh, I'll show you our blocking progression. It's really simple. It's uh, one, uh, one of the drills that we do every day. And I'll work that in on the second session. Um, but I'm gonna talk about, I'd like to talk about motivation. I think what motivates our kids to perform well, play hard. We didn't play real hard in our last game of the season, which is really disappointing. We're trial, still trying to figure out how that happened. I mean, we have our own theories. And, and, and uh, um, Canyon was a, a very good football team. We knew they were going to beat us if we didn't come in and play our A game. And we didn't play our A game. And uh, it was disappointing. And we're still in that process of how did we demotivate our kids or not motivate our kids well enough to play such a good team like like we play. <laughs>
they want it, they want you to be their mentor, their their surrogate father in a lot of ways. So I think the number one step is you have to know your game. And uh, I have a lot of coaches. I have had coaches come and go on my staff, guys that have, kids that have played on me that wanted to coach for me. And uh, the bottom line was these guys don't know the game that well. I've had I've worked with coaches that way. I've coached against coaches that way uh, that are like that. I really feel they did not know the game well enough to be effective coaches. And I could see it in their coaching too when I'd be out on the field. They have to, I think in order for kids to respect you and they pick it up really quick, they have to think that guy knows what he's talking about. He knows the game and he knows the opponents, our opponents game too, the guys that we're playing that's, uh, that are coming up. He knows what our opponents are going to try to do to us. So I don't know if that's an acquired skill. I don't know if it's something that's inbred in coaches or it's something that's a gift in some coaches. I really don't know. I think in some ways I have an eye for the game or a knack to see things out on the field that a lot of coaches don't. And I just, it's not that I feel I'm great at that or I'm a, a really great coach. I think I'm mediocre when it comes to knowing the X's and O's and out scheming people. But I do have an eye for things that are right and not right on the field and the ability to give the, uh, the kids the feedback on their technique. And that goes down to uh, that second point I got on there is teaching the, uh, the game and the technique part of football. I work with, like I said, I work with younger coaches in our staff or our, in our program and I'll sit them in the, uh, I'll sit them in the uh, coach's office and we'll go over things, we'll go over film, I'll say, look, we want this step here, we want the second step here, and then you move your body position like this, and this is how we're going to work that block. And they'll sit there and look, say, I got it, okay, and then we go out on the field, and they give none of that type of feedback because they don't see it as it unfolds in front of them. So I think for kids to, to respect you and for you to motivate them, you have to teach them something they previously could not do before. And that is uh, the technique. If you teach a kid, if you say, get in there, knock that guy down, or knock that guy back, and I work with the offensive line mostly, and you can't teach them how to do that, they're not going to respect you, they're not going to play for you. But if you can teach them how to do it and teach them how to be successful from the technique that you teach them, then they'll say, this coach knows what he's talking about, and I'll play it and I'll try harder for him, I'll listen to him more. Uh, but you have to know the technique. Um, when it's being used, what you're looking for, make changes and give feedback. We do one-on-one -on -one drills, and I was going to show that in the second session. We do one-on-one -on -one drills every day. And uh, I stand behind the defensive line because I'm working with the defensive line, and our offensive coach stands behind the offensive line. And we're just basically starting, we start out the year just watching their two feet. And he's behind the offense, staring down at this guy's feet. I'm behind the defense. Staring down, looking at my guys two feet, and uh, we give that feedback every snap. Like the, whether it was good or bad, the step was short, the, you were too high, too low, your butt was like this, you didn't transfer gaps, uh, you jumped outside the spring. Whatever it is, we give that constant feedback. And when I when I go back to looking at our the coaches in my program or helping them out, and I'm watching their drill work wherever it is across the field or what they're doing, I'm always trying to figure out or listen to what kind of feedback are they giving their kids every drill. Because if they're, I've had coaches out there just throw balls at receivers, grab another one, throw another ball, and give no feedback as to what the, how these guys are catching, how they're breaking their routes, anything like that. And I think that's poor coaching. When you get in our one-on-ones and you're out, we're out there going, that's not good enough, do it again. That means absolutely nothing to those guys. What's not good enough? And why am I doing it again? Or jump in there and do it again. That was great. What was it that was great? What did they do right? I know a lot of us take care of that in film session. That's why we film uh, our parts of our practice. But uh, they have to hear it on the field too. Because that moves practice along and it motivates them in practice also to do better. And when we get in our drill work, our kids work hard in our drill work. They want to succeed because they know we're watching them. And we're going to give them that feedback every step. But uh, good Lord, know what you're looking for. And, and like I said, if you're a coach that 
I don't know what it is. I've had coaches that will stand right there and look at everything, and I'll say, did you, did you think? And they, they can't give the feedback. They don't know what they're looking at. And I don't know if that's ingrained or, or innate or whatever, but that's the essence of great coaching. You have to, you have to see when things, right as they unfold in front of you, whether they're being done right or whether they're being done wrong. And that, depends, and that includes your quarterback, how he's delivering the football, how he's throwing it, how he gets away from center, how he sets up his, uh, his uh, five-step progression or three-step, whatever it is. You have to be just like a film on the field, just like a, a videotape. And uh, we're, we're pretty good at that at Del South. Like I said, we're, we're, you watch our game films, and I think people feel real good about playing us. They go, oh, these guys are simple. They don't do a lot of things. And I think we can beat these guys. And you can beat us, but um, they have a hard time doing it because you're going to have to beat our kids in their technique. And they're, usually our kids are pretty good. Um, <coughs> I think you got to coach every snap, drill, lift, get off stance the entire year. We go out in the summertime and we're doing our conditioning and stuff like that. Uh, I know how hot it gets and how tedious and, and how boring it gets. But we have the offensive line. We, let's say we do our warm-up drills, whatever it may be, uh, speed enhancement or whatever. Always, I, have the set, I have the quarterbacks in the center of the field. I have our skilled guys on one side and our alignment on the other side. And we try to teach our kids. Now, people have asked too. They said, you're, you guys you're, get your offensive line off the ball pretty well. And that has been part of our tradition, is to try to get our offensive line, get our first steps down before defense can come out of their stance. And they do a pretty good job of that traditionally. And they go, how do you do that? Well, it starts like right now. It starts in January. When, whenever we step out on the field and we're going to start assembling our team, and when they start their movement on the field, we go, we start right from the stance. And our quarterbacks call the cadence. So I don't care if they're coming out half speed or one-eighth speed, they're going to come out of a stance and they're going to take the proper steps out and they're going to come off the cadence. And I'm going to stand behind them or near them or on the side of them watching their stance, watching their first steps out and seeing them get off the ball and that all starts in January. And uh, that's what I meant by coaching throughout the whole year. Stance, get off, everything you do. When we're in the weight room too, we're coaching all the lifts. And uh, teaching those guys how to clean, how to, how to uh, what we want off, off the squats, the plyometric stuff, the core training. Um, but that's, uh, that's diligence and it's exhausting. I used to come home from practice and dragging my ass and, and my wife's like, what's the matter with you? I go, I'm exhausted. Why? You, I mean, you're only out there two hours. It's just mentally exhausting when you're, you're doing a lot of coaching because you're watching and assessing every, every play. Um, so we do that. And if I coach, our coaches have a tendency to, to want to stay, sit around and play catch with the ball while the kids are warming up or stretching, or they start their uh, ballistic running, and coaches are still BSing. And, and I don't want that. I want those guys watching those guys and giving them the feedback all the way down the road. And we all, you know, we all fall back on that, but you have to keep getting back to it. Hey, we're not giving these guys enough feedback. Or we're kind of, we're kind of being lazy in practice. Um, here's something I think that uh, is important. Is point E I put up there. If you don't know something about the game, don't fake it. I, when I was a younger coach, I always wanted to say. I always wanted to hold that over their head. I know more about this game than you do. So you got to listen to me. And uh, it was more of an ego thing, I believe, more of an insecurity thing on my part. Uh, I didn't want a kid challenging me, asking me a question I didn't know the answer to. And after a while, I got tired of that facade. I got tired of that, that energy put into that. And if the kid asked me a question, I go, I don't know. So, um, I'll get back to you, or let's work on it. But I found out that's a good part of coaching. Because I'm not trying to be facetious, but if someone, if one of those kids asks me stuff that I really don't know the answer to, or what we're going to do, or I say, oh shit, what are we going to do if they bring that guy out the corner? Uh, I said, I, I've 
what I learned was I threw it back at them. What do you think we should do? And, and in a real honest way. And I had a team in 87 or 97 that uh, were, I had a team of like 1,200 SAT type kids all the way across the board. They were brilliant. And uh, they were so fun to work with. And they posed so many questions to me, not to be idiots, but real legitimate questions. And I'd say, well, what do you guys think? And uh, they would come up with an answer. And they'd come up with a good one, too. And I thought, well, let's do it that way. And I learned that through that trial, to kind of trial and error, and, and letting them know that I don't have all the answers, it taught them, I figured this out through, through this year, teach those guys to be problem solvers. And through my own letting go type of thing, what do you think, guys? Uh, they taught those guys how to be problem solvers, and they started discussing things and owning things on their own. And it even got to a point where I would say goodbye to them at, on, on Saturday after we broke down our Friday night game film. And I'd, I'd, I'd draw up the, just a preliminary front that I thought we were going to face the following week from another team. And I'd say, I'd give it to them, just one page. I'd say, come back with some plays that you guys think we should run next week or practice during practice. And those guys would come back with plays. And they'd come back with plays that I thought, yeah, this is a good idea. That would work. And they'd know how to block them. And they'd figure out how to block them. And they'd start discussing it among each other. And uh, at the end of the year, I thought, man, what a brilliant coach I am. I taught these guys how to be problem solvers. But it only resulted from me saying, I really don't know what I'm doing out here. So <laughs> there's one of those things that if those kids, if your kids can do it, give them the lead way to do it. And I think that is great coaching. Uh, in the beginning of all the when I coached the offensive line, I did for 11 years. And I don't coach them anymore, but I still have my hand in it. Uh, when I coached them, at the beginning of the year, they come off the field, and we gather around an oil board, and we draw up, oh, what are they doing out there? Where's the one plan? What's the three? Who's got this shade? Where's that linebacker stack? And they'd give me the feedback, and I'd go, okay, here's what we're going to do. And as the season went on, and I told those kids all the time, I said, I want you to solve your own problems because you're out there doing it, not me. You've got the best sight lines. You've got everything. You know how strong your, your guy is, the guy you're playing on. You're going to have to make the calls. You guys solve your own problem. That's what I want from you as we go on through the season. And lo and behold, if that's the expectation you have of them, they'll do it. So they'd come off the field initially at the starts of the season, and they'd be, well, what do you think? Or they'd be standing waiting for instruction from me. And I'd give them some, and I wouldn't give them a lot because I couldn't give them a lot. I didn't know a lot. I didn't know a lot. You know, I could see from an angle, and I could give them a lot. I think that guy... What is he in a five? Is he in a six? And as the season progressed, those guys would start huddling with each other. They wouldn't even come around me. And they'd, I'd see them down the sideline. There'd be the, the three or four that are going one way. And they'd be discussing, you do this, I'll do that. I'll take this guy by myself. My guy is pretty tough. I'm going to need help on him. And they start solving their own problems. And hey, they did a great job of it. They'd come and ask me questions, but for the most part, they solve their own problems. I think that's a good coaching philosophy all the way across the board. Teach your guys how to solve their own problems and not and not fix everything for them. We ask their parents not to do that. And uh, I think it's okay for coaches to, to work on that level too. Uh, I've got, uh, I have coaches too that are the nicest guys in the world and uh, their personalities are real supportive, caring, and then they come out to the field and they turn into these Jekyll and Hyde guys. And they'd be yelling and, and angry and because uh, they felt, I mean, I think they felt that's how they were coached as, as high school kids. And that's the way coaching is. But I think that you have to totally be yourself out there and, and not try to uh, be someone you're not, fit into their world and all that other stuff. And, and I think kids respect, that's another part of respect, kids respect that. Uh, they see me as kind of a dry, humorless guy. And I'm not humorless, I, I do have fun with those guys. But they know me, they know who I am, and they know all the other coaches on the staff, and that's what they expect from me. And uh, if I'm not that for them, 
then they're going, what's wrong with him? He's he's not uh, he's not being real. He's not keeping it real. <laughs> <laughs> so if being real is being dull, boring, and square, they still appreciate that. And I, I tend to lean toward more towards that. Um, I'm not real organized on the field. I don't. Have, I, some days we don't even have a practice plan. We'll have a game plan like plays. But my staff has been together so long, and we've had a lot of good continuity. Sometimes we'll walk out to the field and say, "How much time do you need? Give me 15 minutes here. Give me 20 minutes there, and we'll adjust on the fly." And we can do that sometimes. But I, I want all of us to be organized from drill to drill. Whatever it is you're going to be doing out there. Be, know what you're doing and be well organized in. And that goes right down to the, uh, even my experienced guys who go out there and they'll say, oh, I need one of those square bags. Where are the square bags? Or uh, I need another football. And kids are standing around and tick, there goes the clock. It's just, it's moving as you're trying to uh, set your drill up. Where are you going to work on the field? All that other stuff. That I think has to be well, it has to be worked out because when you break, and all of a sudden your guys are right in your face and you're going, oh yeah, uh, let's work uh, over there. And they're like, ah, oh, geez, this is how we're going to start practice. I think those guys appreciate when you go, get over there, we're going to do this, and you're moving your drills quick. They respect that. Um, I can do better on age, knowing my players on a personal level. And uh, I think my assistants are a lot better at that than me. You got to have somebody on your staff that's good at that, and uh, I think we all should be decent at that. But you got to have guys on your staff that are really into the kids and know them and talk to them out in the locker room, and you'll pick up a lot of a lot of good things and problems that you can head problems off. Help kids in their schoolwork, help kids in their homework uh, or their home life, and uh, that's why we're out there to help kids. So. How can you help them if you don't know them? You've got to get to know your kids. When I start, when I assemble the team for the first time, and I'll reiterate it from time to time, but um, I'm going to have this talk real soon. It's I that uh, I go in every year. I say, I will do anything I can for you guys. If you ask me, I will do anything possible for you. Uh, and that's anything. But I'm not going to be your buddy, and I may have I may say things to you and do things to you you're not going to like, and uh, they like that. They want that from us. They they want us to be that tough love guy, and whether they're getting that at home or not, most of them aren't. Uh, they respect that. So if ever if if you're going to let them slide or if you want to, you know. I don't play around a lot with my kids. They don't need me as their friend. They need me as their coach, and they need me as an example and a mentor to them. And uh, I don't think kids get enough of that today. So I want them to have that from me. I want I want them to see me and go, oh, there's coach. He's kind of a clown. I want them to say, there's coach. That guy can really help me in a lot of, in a lot of different ways. He knows what he's doing and talking. Uh, I have a lot, one of the things about being, I think, having a great program and being a great coach is knowing the subculture to your team. And I think a lot of coaches turn, turn their uh, face to things that are going on in their program and things that, are, that the kids are doing. And they'll say, I don't want to know this. I don't want to hear this. Don't tell me that. Uh, kids around school that aren't football players will start talking about what football players are doing. And we're like, oh, no, that's not true. I'm sure that they're not doing those things. When we hear those things, we follow up on them. And we go after them. If I hear a kid in the locker room say something totally inappropriate to another kid, I go right into them. I say, what did you just say? I will be conf confrontational to those kids. A lot of coaches don't want to be confrontational. They want to, oh, I don't want to get into that. And uh, whatever... And it, it, it's got to be able to, you got to cross all social and racial barriers with that too. No matter who's doing it or who's saying it, whatever. You're their coach, you got to be fair and consistent. And uh, we, I want to know the subculture and the rumors and all the other stuff that's going on on my team. Because I found out that 90% of rumors are usually true. And uh, 
we pursue them and go after them. And the kids respect that too. They know that about us. They know that about our staff. If I had to step out of line, those guys are probably going to find out about it. That's how they think. And they're right, too. Um, the last part, too, is K. Uh, what I have up there for K is uh, I remember everything my Pop Warner coach said to me in eighth grade, when I was in eighth grade. I remember all his, uh, his quotes. I remember what he told me. I remember what he said to me. I just remember this. Why? Am I a nut? Am I, am I crazy in the head? I don't think I'm an anomaly. I think I'm pretty much the average guy. I had I have kids come back to me to play for me in the early 80s. I said, hey, coach, remember when you called, called, called me a jackass or something like that? I'm like, oh my God, did I do that? I go, I apologize. He goes, no, 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 that was OK. You know, it was funny. I go, no, it's not funny. Um, those guys remember all those things we say to them. So you got to be careful about what you say and what you do with your kids. I try not to publicly humiliate my kids. And, and that means when you get your kids in the team setting and you're like, you played like crap today, you know, and you're pointing a kid out right in, right in front of your team, that's not a good idea. You know, if he played like crap, I want him to know it, but I'll pull him aside up in the coach's office, get him back there and say, you played like crap today. And I don't want to. I don't want to do that in front of his peers. I don't think that's a healthy thing to, uh, to do. And especially, I, I'm not a choir boy. I do my share of. Uh, I'll drop an f bomb here and there, or a cuss here and there. But I've never at a kid. I've never cussed at a kid or directed one at him. I'll use it as an adjective over a situation. <laughs> At least when I, that's what I tell the principal when he asks me. <laughs> and being a Christian brother, he hates that. But I, we're, we're, not, we're not bad at the line. Occasionally something will come out, usually in our own team private setting. But. Um, motivation. I, I'm sure all you guys have started up and uh, gotten yourselves organized. And we started up last week. Uh, everything I think in your off season has to be like in the fall. Organized, times, programs, everything in your lifts. The most important guy in our, our program is our off season conditioning guy. That's the most important coach in your program, I'm convinced. When we when we were the, the Northern California team back in the, the 90s that was was gonna venture down here and play the modern day or poly or uh, some of the teams, when we were that team that was going to come down here and get our asses kicked, according to everybody that thought so, uh, including ourselves, uh, we knew we had to do something about it. And uh, I don't think we were strong enough to compete with modern day. We weren't strong enough to compete with Pauly. And uh, we had to change. We had to, do, we had to ramp up our off-season and <coughs> our commitment and the level of intensity, and we did that. And uh, we got ourselves into a position where success was possible, and that's all in the offseason. That was all attributable to our strength and conditioning now. He did that. He got us into a position where we could be successful. And those tables were turned on us when we went up to play Bellevue, the team that broke our winning streak. Uh, I watched film. The first game of the season, I watched Bill all of the three games on them for the three last games from their, uh, the previous year. I had them all scouted out. I watched them. I go, these guys aren't that good. I mean, I thought, they're okay. But, and I knew we were down a little bit. Talent has to go, we'll beat them. We can beat those guys. Well, we went up there, and this team just ripped us apart. And as, as I, midway through the second quarter, I go, we're, where in the hell did this team come from? They were unbelievably different. Stronger, faster. They were just beating the tar out of us, physically. And uh, they did things that we were doing before. And uh, I'm, I'm going, we're working to, going to the airport the following day, and I open up the newspaper, and their coaches in there going, we studied those guys, not just their film, but we studied their philosophy, and we did the exact same things those guys did. We took out their off-season program and we worked it just like those guys worked it. 
They read that book that came out about our win streak. They, they studied us and they emulated our our work and our work habits and our work ethic. And I even said that during the game. I go, this is like playing yourself. Only we're not ourselves. And uh, it was it was really an eye-opening experience of what an offseason can do for you. And that guy, those guys put in an unbelievable offseason. And where they were that previous year to where they were that first game out was phenomenal. So we get 100%, try to get 100% participation. And a lot of people ask me, what about basketball, guys? I don't have hardly any guys play basketball. I mean, the sport is specialized, especially football, basketball, and overlap so much, and even in the summer. Uh, very exceptional athletes can do both. And we've only had the exceptional guys do both. But we do have a lot of track guys and baseball guys in our football program. And uh, they're saying a lot of schools go, our football, our baseball guy doesn't want us touching those, uh, our athletes in the uh, baseball season. Well, shit, baseball season goes from like, for us, from February to the end of school. So these guys are going to miss out on three, four months of, uh, three and a half months of conditioning where we're trying to put on weight and strength. And uh, we tell, we tell those guys, that's not going to work for us. And luckily, our, football, our, our baseball coach is kind of on board with it. He's like, yeah, go ahead, take those guys and lift them. But we have to lift them in the morning. So there's another time commitment from coaches that you really don't want to get, you know, you're thinking, oh, man, do I got to get up at 6.30 or 6 o'clock this morning, be down to school, get these guys started at 7 and whatever so they can get their lift in. Well, if you want your baseball players coming back to you, not light years behind the other guys, yeah, you got to do that. Because we got our track guys back in the past, and we got our baseball guys back in the past that weren't lifting, and they were so far behind, they never caught up. Because when we get into the summer, we, we're moving into different things. We're into more conditioning, we're into more quickness drills, we decrease our, our uh, bulk training, and these guys, they're left behind. And uh, so we work it where we try to get those guys in there in the morning and we say, hey, this is the way it is, you want to play. And they're usually good about it. And I'm lucky, our track coach, our baseball coach, they like that. Go ahead, get those guys stronger. They'll be better track, track athletes, they'll be better baseball players. And uh, when they get into their playoffs, we back off those guys and let them go ahead. And when they're in the track trials, when they get into the section trials or they, they're approaching their, uh, their playoff games <coughs> in baseball, they say, go ahead, you devote the rest of your time the next three, four weeks to, to your season. But that three and a half months where they're spitting sunflower seeds and sitting on the bench, <laughs> uh, truly, they come out and they're in such horrible condition that uh, they can't even run a 400. They can't uh, without, you know, they just can't keep up with us. It's, it's light, they're light years away from each other. So that's, I think, a very important part in your uh, program development. Your strength and conditioning guy and working those guys in the off season. Um, am I on that page? No. Two, three, go. All right. Um, we're we're going to do, we, we haven't done this yet, I think this is really a very important thing to do. Evaluate your kids on their past season, and you got to do it one-on-one -on -one with them. And uh, we usually hand out a form, I wish I had it, I don't have it with me. We hand out a form with all these, you can make, it up, make them up yourself, toughness, ability, quickness, whatever it is, and they rate themselves and even write a statement about how their season went for them and what they, how they thought they did. Half your guys will come up, well, I put it this way, a third of your guys will be right on the money on their own evaluation. A third of them will evaluate themselves maybe lower than what you would do. And most definitely, maybe the majority of them would evaluate themselves way better than what you think they, how you think they did. And that's that opportunity to start setting some goals with your kids and that goal, and that goal setting. Um, so we evaluate our guys and let them know this is what we thought of you as a football player. Here's where your weaknesses, here's where your strengths, here's what you need to work on, and let's start goal setting. Let's start goal setting. Kids do not know how to goal set. I found, I, I think, 
That's my opinion. Two things that kids don't know how to do very well. Lead effectively and goal set. And I think it's your, our job as coaches to teach them how to do both. To be effective leaders, because most kids think effective leading is yelling at their, their you know, I got, I'm the team captain, I'm the leader, I'm going to yell at you. Or uh, I just, I try to teach our kids how to be good, effective leaders. But goal setting is another one. They'll come in and they'll say, oh, I want to be, I want a Division One scholarship. I'm like, you're 200 pounds and, and you're going line. That's not going to happen. Um, you got to revamp their goals and you got to re redirect their goals. Then, uh, you got to help them, that's what I mean by helping them set their short term, uh, long term, and, uh, and short term and long term goals. All their goals have to be measurable too, to be a goal. And they have to be clear. So, all I got up there, all goals must be accompanied with an action plan that's what they must do in order to accomplish those goals. It's important to understand this involves behavioral attitude, work habit changes. This is what needs to be measurable and observable, like how many workouts they've missed or pounds lifted. And we chart our guys in the off season too. We chart their lifts. We chart how much pounds, how many pounds are increased in their, their lifting. So when kids fall short, um, when kids fall short, we have them write their goals on, a, on a, off their computers. So they have a copy in their computers. And then when they come back and they show them to us, if their goals are not measurable, or if they're pie in the sky, they can give them back to them and say, uh, we got, you got to rework these goals. They're not going to be effective for you. Uh, and then we give them suggestions. And then they'll rework them and bring them back. They'll have the action plan that they want in order to accomplish them. And we'll keep them in a file. And when we get into the, the off season and they're in there lifting, and we got guys coach watching, what we call coach watchers. You know all those guys. They're standing in the corner. They're looking around, seeing if you're looking at them. And if you are, then they jump in there and try to start lifting. If, if you're not, they're just kind of standing and watching. We have those guys too. And if you see guys or they're down there lifting and you notice, this guy's lifting the same way he was last month. We bring him in. We pull the uh, goal sheet out and say, hey, you know, you said you want to do this. What you're doing is not consistent with what you want to accomplish. So we hold their goals against them to motivate them. And uh, I think that's effective. Most, you don't have to do that for every kid. You do it for the guys that are kind of sliding or they're not progressing as far as, or as uh, well as you'd want them to. That's one of the things with our running backs. Our running backs this year were not strong runners. They were weak, including our quarterback, all three of them in an option offense. They couldn't break a tackle. They had to have this great offensive line blocking to make yardage. And, uh, <coughs> You know, I, I remember watching them in the weight room. I go, these guys are going to hurt us in the season. Look at them. Look at how they lift. They're like, eh. They're lifting the same weight from month to month. And uh, I don't know what it was. I couldn't motivate those guys to take that extra jump. And it did hurt us during the season. It hurt them as, uh, as players. Um, that's why I have to pull out their goal sheets. I think the kids want to achieve, but they don't know how. And uh, all their goals sound goofy, like I'm going to be all league and I'm going to play 100% and all those other things. And, and you know that's not a goal. I mean, come on, let's let's short, let's have, let's put some uh, speed goals in there and lift goals first, and then we'll work about on the football goals. All right, our summer workouts. This I think we had a different number last year, but I think it was like 34 workouts in the May. And, uh, you know, the school has a rule like, hey, if your kids don't make a workout or 34 workouts, you can't prohibit him from wanting to play football <laughs> because it's, it's, it's voluntary. And it is. And uh, I've, never had, I've never had that happen, though. I've never had, at least on the varsity level, we had on the lower levels because kids want to play little league baseball or they're taking a, the families going to Europe for two months or whatever. And, uh, but the varsity kids, they make those workouts or they're not gonna, we're not going to let them play. And I haven't had a parent challenge me on that yet or an administrator because I have our parent meeting in the spring and I tell them exactly what I want from those kids and I try to head those off. 
in the spring, which I highly recommend that you meet with your we meet with your parents in the springtime, and you tell them exactly your expectations, your philosophy, your substitution policies, who's going to start, who or the kind of kid that's going to start, who's going to be on the uh, you know the different levels of kids you have. <coughs> I tell those parents starting out when I have that meeting, I go, I've got 55 kids on this team. I've got one kid on this team that's our best player. But you know what else that means? I've got one kid on this team that's our 55th player. And I go, and everybody falls in between. So where your son is, we're going to determine, and he's going to fall on that graph somewhere. And it's just get the, kid, the, player, the, the parents to know that, hey, maybe my kid is not a first-string player, or maybe he's not which a lot of them think a Division I guy. Uh, and it helps letting those parents know this is why the kid, what, this is what we're trying to do with the kids as they play for us. Um, we're trying to teach them life skills. We're trying to teach them how to succeed in, in the game and get better. Uh, it's not all about starting. But anyway, I lay out all the team expectations, and I try to get the, I get the parents involved. And I'll talk about that in, in a minute. I think summer. Um, all your summer stuff has to be well thought out, organized, challenging. I think this is where your team is created, is when through those hard dog day, hot days of summer, when you're, they're all down there and they're doing all the prep work that you're asking them to go through. And uh, that includes uh, getting things, accomplishing things as a coach. Um, put your stuff on a calendar. We try to put our stuff on, stuff on the calendar as soon as we can, we can figure it out, give it to all the kids. Work your jobs, work all the other stuff around all the stuff we're doing. This is a priority. So we have, we have all that stuff on June, July, August calendar. Um, we use our passing link to find our DBs and receivers and most of our skilled guys. When we're done in the summertime and then when it's time to put the pads on, we usually know exactly who's going to be our secondary and who's going to be our receiving core. And uh, we search for them there, too. And we tell the kids that, too. We're going to find our starters this summer, at least guys that are going to start out the season. And uh, so they take that very seriously. Then in our passing league, I, it's exasperating going into those uh, passing league games. I really don't care. But when I'm standing there watching our te uh, the teams that we're, we're playing against, they're running five guys all over the field. Quarterback's taking a two-step drop, just wait and wait and wait. And wait. I'll put the dink one up for a kid, and he'll run 30 yards. I'm like, okay. Um, we, we don't do those things. I mean, it, it, most of our routes in the uh, passing lane are like our routes in the game. There are two, three receiver routes, and sometimes four, never five. We have very few five receiver routes. If it, so I always keep a guy in. And we run our three or four receiver routes. And if, they, if we can get the ball in there and the timing right, we'll be very successful. But you know, work on things that you're going to work on in the fall or you're going to run the fall. Um, you go out to your team and you say, we have, we have to be a team. We have to, be, we, have to, yeah, we have to get together. We have to be a team. Saying it doesn't make it so. I don't care how many times you yell at them or say that to them. We're not a team. We got to be a brotherhood. You got to create team type building things, and uh, we try to do that. I know they're hard to do, and they're very time. Some of them are time consuming. Um, I had a lineman. Uh, 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 I had a coach that loved camping. So he'd take his group camping, or whoever wanted to go camping. He'd take them up camping for a couple days. I think that's great stuff. I'm not a camper. I don't like sleeping on the floor. I don't like having dirt all over me. So. Uh, I'll do other things with the kids, and I'll show you. I'll show you what we, what I do. We have team barbecues. That's how I involve our parents. Say so you want to get involved with the team and want to help us. You're going to help us. Put, we're going to put on some barbecues, or we're going to have, you're going to help us with our Thursday night meeting, <coughs> our team meeting, which I'll get to also. Um, but you got to create team building things. Here's a real effective team builder. You could put. I, I, I recommend you do, you can tweak it, do whatever you want with it, but here's the idea. I call it our, line, our seminar, or I call it our lineman seminar. And all our offensive linemen, 
or our defensive or offensive linemen, and you can do it as a position coach, you can do it with just your DBs. If you're a running back coach, do it just with your running backs. Um, you can do it any way you want to do it, but during the end of summer, like the last three weeks of summer, we hand that out. I would say fill that out honestly as you can possibly fill it out, and uh, and then we're going to uh, come back and evaluate it. <coughs> so they fill this stuff out and look at those questions. Those are pretty good questions. They're self. They're self. Uh, they have to evaluate themselves honestly. Then we come back in the, our classroom and we all circle up. We're, we're not in the weight room. We're in a classroom. We actually have a classroom with a carpet in it, and we sometimes we sit on the floor and try to create that looking at each other atmosphere. We're all going to look at each other, talk to each other. And a student will say, okay, Frank, give us your, uh, what you put down. And he'll run through his goal sheets, or the sheet here, and then uh, we ask, what do you think about what he put down? We ask the kids, what do you think? Give them feedback. And that's where we get those guys talking to each other. And they start evaluating each other. And they'll say, uh, what holds you back from achieving? And if he doesn't write the right thing, we do have kids in our program who say, you don't work hard enough in the weight room. You can work harder. <coughs> and uh, it's not a pick on session, it's how are we gonna get better as a team? Are we gonna hold each other accountable? And are we gonna own the season ourselves? This is helps create leadership on your team also. You have to get your kids going after each other for accountability and for, uh, for hard work. If it comes from you all the time, it's just, uh, there's coach again, he's never happy. But when it comes from a peer, they're like, hey, I don't want my peers to say that about me. It means more. Accountability means more coming from a peer. And we try to get that dynamic going on our team. And we try to include positive things on it too. Say something to someone in here that you would, what you admire about it. And they'll pick some, they'll even pick second, third string guys. You work, you run hard in practice, or you do the gas or work awesome. I respect that. And it gives everybody an opportunity to own something on the team. Everybody's got to go through one of these. And it's time consuming, and it's tedious sometimes, but it's worth, it's worth the effort. It's worth the, uh, you want to pull your unit together? Just like I said, you want a team build? This is a team build. And kids start looking at each other, talking to each other. They say tough love things to each other. They say praise things to each other. Sometimes, if depending on your group, if they're all hard-ass workers, this is, becomes like a love fest. And uh, that's ultimately what you'd like to work for on that. So this is great, I think. And you, like I said, you tweak it and, and put your own questions on there and uh, design it any which way you want to design it. But that's the way I call that's what I call the seminar work. Um, another thing is uh, don't listen or give your team give into your team complaining about conditioning. Don't use conditioning as punishment. I don't. I think that's dangerous. I think that's stupid for a coach to do that. Um, our our uh, our way of disciplining is you're not going to play this week, or you're not going to play for a half. I'm not going to run a kid up and down the field and make him sick or make him or bend him over or anything like that. That's a, that's a, that takes away from an element of the game you want a part of your tradition. Our kids know conditioning is a part of our tradition. And uh, when we tell our kids, line up, we're running, there's not a complaint in the house. And they know how hard we want them to run, too. Because we'll have the time set or we'll have the expectation set. I've never have our kids complain about conditioning. Never. Because they know that's a part of the game, it's a huge part of the game, and they never complain about it. And uh, so don't listen to, uh, do we have to do that, or field their questions. What are we doing for conditioning today? I don't even like that question. Um, I say, that, well, whatever we're going to do, we're going to be getting ready for this week's game. Um, we pride ourselves on being in better condition than our opponents. Hard to do today because everybody's working hard, but uh, we still work for that. Uh, I think they wanted me to take a five minute break and then I'll come back, I'll finish this and I'll try to, I'll go through a line progression that we do at, uh, at Bill's South. But do you want to take five minutes and
spend too much time on this, but I already mentioned that I think this is critical, working uh, with your parents and involving them in a real positive way. And that is uh, uh, parents want to get involved. They really do. They want to help you. And you can get a good team mom. And I've been blessed with these uh, awesome team moms that have organized our parents. Uh, one of our team building, biggest team building activities is our pregame dinners. And our pregame dinners happen the night before uh, our games, which usually end up on a Thursday night if we play on Friday, Friday night if we play on Saturday. And uh, there's a whole ritual we go through on our Thursday, Friday night team dinners. But the parents do the cooking. They do all the cooking, all the logistics. All we do is go from practice, we show up, we eat, we let the kids play a little bit and, and, and let loose some steam. Then we go into our pregame meeting mode, which takes about an hour and a half, and I'll run through that for you what we do. But the parents, they want to do, they want to be involved in the season, but I tell them, we're going to be their coaches. Don't get involved in the, the nuts and bolts. And I tell them, too, about if you have a complaint, don't fight your kids' battles. Send them back to us. We're not ogres. They say, oh, I'm intimidated, or I don't like talking to coach. I say, that's all bullshit. Send them back to us and teach them how to be men and uh, confront and, and, and own their own problems. And uh, I said, if they come back and they're still not satisfied with our answers or they're not, they're not unhappy, by all means call us, then we will be. But don't fight him his battles right off the bat. If he's unhappy, send him back to us and, tell him, and have him tell us why we're unhappy or why he's unhappy. But I, I, I write down everything I want the parents to know, and it heads off a ton of problems. I'm sure a lot of you guys do the same thing. But uh, it's wise to do that. You don't want you don't want them coming. Oh, you never told. I never knew that, or you never told me that, or that's not what my my son told us. And they can hear it right out of your own mouth. Team dinners for me is something you guys can do if you don't already do it. Team building activity. Dinners away from school the night before the game. Dinners is time for fun, lap, and socialization. Parents get to experience. Okay, went over that. Then here's the serious side. I give my pregame talk uh, before. I don't. I don't give any talks on game day. I don't try to rile them up. I don't try to rally them or anything like that. My pregame talk is this. We're playing. We're we're we're, gonna be, we're playing whoever. I mean, we're playing modern day tomorrow night, and here's my take on this contest. And I give them my pregame talk. What I think we need to do. What I think we that they're going to do. And I let all the other coaches say a few words too. I don't want it to talk in. I don't want anybody to get up there and and give us the Gettysburg address. But I want them to be succinct and to the point and talk to the team if they have something important to say to the team. There's our pregame talk. Uh, then we go through the opponent checklist. That's just, it's like brainstorming. Uh, we go, okay, we're going to cover defense. Let's go. And our defensive guys will stand up. They'll start giving tendencies, best plays, best players, our checkouts, all the things. When they come into this formation, we're going to check down to this. Uh, here's their favorite play out of that formation. And they just, kids just pop up out of their seats and they start that brainstorming activity we call a flight list or a checklist. That's that last minute stuff that we feel they need to know what we covered in practice throughout the week that, that they're going to need to know in the game when it comes at you. So it's a last minute reminders. Uh, and then we go through the offense and some of the special teams too. So whatever is important for them to know in that game tomorrow night, they got to know it Thursday night. And if they forget things, we as coaches stand up and say, don't forget this one. Don't re you know, remember that one. Um, I want our kids on Thursday night, when we break our meeting, we break usually at 9 o'clock at night, or try to get them out there as, as quickly as possible. But when they break, I want them fully prepared to play the game. Not on Friday. I want them Thursday night ready to go. And they usually are. And the reason why I did that, we incorporated these meetings. Like the first six years that I coached, we came out every game, and we were, we were just getting crushed in the first quarter, and it took us a while to warm up. I thought we were coming out slow, it doesn't seem like we're fired up, it doesn't seem like we're ready, and uh, I think it was attributable to, we were, I didn't get those guys ready soon enough. And when they walk out Thursday, they're excited, they're really, 
Everything's done. All right, we're all set. We're ready to go. Um, the second part is the emotional aspect of the game. Uh, and I say, okay, we went through the checklist, with the mechanical, the logistical, whatever. Now, how do you guys feel about playing this game? I mean, feel. And that's where I want kids to stand up and be able to express how they feel, whatever it is. Whether they're fearful, whether they're angry, whether they're uh, excited, whether they're counting on, uh, as the season goes on, these get very, they do get very intense and emotional sometimes. I'll get kids that will stand up and say, I'm counting on, you know, I'm counting on you, Jim. Or Jimmy, you got you have to, uh, when we're blocking this guy together, I want your best effort. And they'll start, again, holding each other accountable if they feel that uh, maybe some of their teammates aren't playing up to what their capabilities are. And that's that part of that emotional time, too. That's not, that doesn't happen every week. But it, it does happen throughout the season. And you have to be pretty smart at where you want this thing to go. Sometimes we got into this emotional part of our team meetings and it started to go into a pick on, let's pick on this dude tonight. And uh, like, whoa, you know, we're not going down that avenue. <coughs> and, and, and a lot of times I, I, I preface this too, if, if you're going to speak on the emotional aspect of the game, you speak for yourself too. It's got to be I, I, I. I feel this. I think this. I believe this. Because in these team meetings, sometimes kids will get up and go, we need to get out there to, tomorrow night. We need to kick some ass. And I'm looking at this kid, and I'm going, this kid hasn't kicked ass all of season. What the hell is he talking about? And uh, I'll stop the kid like that. I'll say, stop. And I'll tell him, what are you going to do? What, why are you saying we? Talk about what you're bringing tomorrow. Talk about what you feel right now. And uh, I'll let those other guys, the guys that are kicking ass, if he wants to stand up and what I, I do, I, I think is good stuff, and say, you're not kicking ass out there. I'll say, yeah, go with that. Run with that. Because when you get your team leaders that can really play, and they're standing up, and they're, and they're doing it in a good way. They're not doing it in a... <coughs> Uh, a puffed up brash way. When they start holding, calling guys out and holding them accountable, that's part of our tradition. Our kids will hold each other accountable. Here's another part of our tradition I don't have up here. I insist that our kids coach each other too. And when I coach the offensive line, when that first team stepped back off the sled or out of their reps, they didn't step back and pop their lids and start talking to each other. They had to step back stop and watch that next guy, that second string guy in front of him, do his stuff, do his technique. And I, if, you, if you're vigilant about this, they'll develop it as a habit, they'll start coaching each other and say, your first step's too short, or you didn't get your second step down, or you didn't have your club, or you got outside his frame, or whatever it is. They'll start giving those, the guys that may take their position or could possibly take their position, they end up coaching. And then the second string guy is coaching the first string guy. And I tell him, I said, I got two eyeballs out here, and uh, if I can get, you know, eight sets of eyeballs out here watching our steps, how much better are we going to be? And the kids, you know, made sense to them. And I said, and that is team two. <laughs> We're helping each other be better players. So. I pride ourselves when I hear our kids coaching each other. I think, hey, that's why we're out here. One guy helping another guy. And isn't that what teamwork is? Isn't that what brotherhood is? And what we preach all the time. So I like our guys coaching. Not only that, it reinforces their idea of what the proper technique is. Oh, yeah, your first step was only six inches. It should be 10. You know, they start seeing things, too. And uh, they'll hold them all, they're themselves accountable. All right. Uh, as, as the emotional part, as soon as 